The morning begins with a mass attack from Russian bombers. I haven't seen anything like this before. At times, there are 40 to 50 planes in the sky at once. I'm automatically driven to think about the futuristic drawings in War of the Future, a magazine that I read years ago. Dominic in the Battle of Kiev. One could laugh if the situation wasn't so serious. Budeni has released his swallows for the Kiev air show. There is a droning and buzzing so loud that one cannot hear oneself think. The Ratas, those agile biplanes and the Martin bombers, attack German positions with bombs and their onboard cannons. For the first time, they are also releasing shells and catapult bombs, which hit the ground before the plane is even overhead. Scheisse, comrades. We must rethink our entire cover strategy. We must learn. We receive orders to attack at around 10 o'clock hours. It smells like trouble. The division apparently got stuck after making good progress yesterday. The roaring of artillery is deafening. Three groups receive orders to wind their way through the minefield in order to make contact with our overextended front line. My group's task is to reach the Teremki estate by 11.30 hours. The commander and his adjutant, who arrived from Gatnoja, have already taken position at the estate early this morning. We do not have to hear a speech to know that the passage through the minefield will not be easy. Three curtains of artillery fire are released over the field through which we have to pass not to mention the shrapnel, mines and bombers. There is no time for discussion. We pick up our equipment and weapons without saying a word. A moment later we begin our mission, walking in single file. Without the cover of clouds, the sun burns hot. The mugginess is driving us mad. We bring two two units along as per our orders, which will be part of an observation post near the front line. These poor guys are carrying such heavy boxes on their backs. Little Arthur collapses after a few hundred metres. Dear God, how will we accomplish this mission? We reached the first artillery curtain, but have not yet crossed it. Don't give up now. One of our comrades places the heavy box on his back and we continue, passing by the carcasses of stinking horses and dead soldiers. Many mangled corpses are lying in our path. They have black and swollen faces. We now move off the cobblestone road. Everything was going well up to this point. Four enemy aircraft then suddenly appear, flying so close to the ground that we can feel the slipstream from their propellers. These Schweiner stalk us for about five minutes. Why are we throwing ourselves into the mud? They're flying so low just to have a headcount. Their sporadic fire does not cause any harm. Our group appears to be too small to be worth a real attack. They turn away and drop their bombs further down the cobblestone road. At the barn? Ask any Kiev fighter for the barn at Gatnoje, and he will walk away in silence with his memories of the wretched brick walls covered with mangled and bloody bodies. This awful place. We take a break since it is the only source of shade on the entire field. A cigarette is hastily smoked. It is said to calm one's nerves. However, it has no such effect on us. We have a clear view of our path through the mine-infested field, past the shredded forest, all the way to our destination, the ruins of Teremki. The three murderous curtains of enemy artillery fire are most intimidating. I suddenly do not like the taste of my cigarette anymore. Scheisse. It is all a bunch of scheisse. Little Arthur is so excited. The tension inside him is so intense that he starts telling jokes. It is well known that quiet and shy guys turn into jokesters full of quick repartee under such circumstances. He has come up with lines that he could not have created otherwise, even with half an hour of thinking. But what does it matter? We have to move on. Orders are orders. They are performed as they are received. My group reaches the Teremki estate at 11.20 hours. There is not much talk about how we got there. It is a miracle. With luck on our side, we walked past hundreds of mines and crossed an artillery curtain which offered us only small amounts of shrapnel. We have arrived and are in one piece, except for a few scratches. My poor tofu men took much longer. Their backs are bloody from the heavy boxes. How many times during these few kilometres did we have to throw ourselves down on the ground for cover? One is mistaken if he thinks that we could quickly recuperate from the horrors of our march. When it rains, it pours. Shell after shell howls toward us and smashes the pathetic ruins of the Teremki estate. Debris is swirling through the air. Our comrades have organised dugouts in checkerboard style. 
Our sap position is close to the last house, in the middle of a vegetable garden with half a dozen shredded trees. We have to crawl in order to reach our cover holes. We barely made it into them by the time the sky was suddenly filled with those damn biplanes. They approach in squadron formation from the right of the forest. They fly lower and lower. The machine guns rattle to the tune of the plane's engines. They are good at this, these Schweiner. I can see the pilots stretching out of their seats and over the fuselage in order to scan the ground and throw their dreadful hand grenades. My stomach starts to churn. The coffee I drank this morning isn't sitting well with me. They come down even lower, fly over our position, and turn toward the forest. Their red stars on the bottom of the wings sparkle in the sun. Just lay still, very still. My steel helmet is feeling increasingly heavy. How long has it been since I slept? I cross my arms behind my head and lie on the ground with my eyes closed. The soil is pleasantly cool. Damn it. I actually fell asleep in all of this commotion. Yes, I even dreamt. We were on a walk, you and I, Roselle. We were standing on top of a rock similar to our favourite place in Falkenstein. We were overlooking a plain that was filled with smoke and fire. You were leaning against me and started to cry silently. Well, dreams are sometimes weird. Nonsense. My brave Roselle does not cry because of smoke and fire. The enemy ordinances have been ploughing into our position for hours now. The wind drives suffocating clouds of smoke over us. The reds are shooting with all that they have. Large chunks, small chunks, shells. Their fire is landing very well. So well, in fact, that one can see our dreadful tarpaulins scattered all over. At times a hand with stiff and cramped fingers or a boot sticks out from underneath them. Ladies, these are your husbands and sons who are lying stiff and torn apart. You are perhaps enjoying the sunny day at this moment, the babble of your children or their sparkling eyes. You have no idea that soon you will receive a letter that renders your life unbearable. Do not think about this. God help me. Do not think about this. We know that the suffering of our wives and mothers is greater than ours here in this downpour of shrapnel. The artillery fire suddenly stops in the afternoon. This is understandable. Even the toughest butcher must have a break for breakfast. I can imagine how they are sitting over there, with grins on their devilish faces black from the soot. I can imagine their smacking while they eat. Let's get back to business, says Comrade Commissar as their dirty and greasy paws reach for the shells and stroke the cool steel, which tears apart the damn fascists. Just wait, you damn bloodhounds. Soon it will be our turn. We use the break from the firing to our advantage. Doors, fences, boards and beams are hauled in from the surrounding area in order to build covers for our holes. Earthen walls are reinforced. Anything capable of catching splinters is arranged around the holes. Buckets, barrels, chairs, benches. As we put the final touches on our fortification, the air is all of a sudden filled with the roaring of approaching shells and their impacts. Teremki is nothing but a sea of surging black smoke. The last remaining bricks are being tossed into the air. Heavy Russian shells slam again and again into its ruins. I have counted 243 blows within half an hour. 243 times 500 shards. That makes 121,500 red-hot glowing pieces of metal which are flying over the ground, and which can rip apart everything in their way. Maybe one of you can tell me if there remains a hands-width portion of space within a 1,000-metre radius that has not been penetrated by the death-carrying iron shards. It is impossible to describe the horror throughout the hours until the evening. I press myself to the bottom of my hole, half mad from fear and horror. Doesn't anyone have a bit of compassion for us miserable bundles of humans who are almost insane and who are holding on with their teeth in the dirt? For God's sake, if it has to be, at least let me die instantaneously. The moaning and the shouting of the wounded are faintly audible through the howling and crashing. You poor guys. Who do you think will be able to help you? The one who leaves his cover will be rattled with splinters like that old bucket up there. It is finally getting dark and quiet after long and horrific hours. Life is coming back to our position. Spades clatter, flares rise into the sky, and moaning and shouting rise from the trenches and holes closest to the front line. Paramedics run out with their stretchers. Groups are sitting together in holes and carve crosses. Fires die down and every now and then there is a crackling from the burned-out houses and barns. 
Again and again, a whimpering or a cry cuts through like a razor. The barrage starts up again suddenly in the morning. From one moment to the next, the air is filled with whistling and howling. A fist presses my head into the ground. A hammer slams into the soil with a roar. The earth trembles and the muddy ground buckles until it finally bursts. Six large calibers came to within 30 meters of us. It smells like mud and gunpowder. If there is still a god in heaven, I am begging him to finish us off. Bring this to an end. Just end it. I cannot take this any longer. Someone amongst us must have gone crazy. He jumps out of the trench, throws his arms wildly into the air and laughs. He finally jumps into the barbed wire and breaks down after being hit by repeated shrapnel as the next rounds of shells arrive. Poor devil, what got into you? I know so much about you. You are married with four children. You have not had a vacation in over a year. You had it. It is all in the past now. Damn, I cannot go on like this much longer. And then I go and do something completely crazy. I take a bottle that still has a bit of schnapps in it, sit up on the edge of the trench and take a big sip. I take my time in closing the flask and throw it into the trench of the neighbouring group. I also attached a short note stating, Are there any bastards there? Please pass this on. The bottle with its little note works wonders. After about ten minutes it lands back in my hole. Someone added to the note, There aren't any shysicola here. Suddenly, a large group of aircraft appears, followed by a wonderful surprise. Three Messerschmitts are quickly approaching. I don't care about the shrapnel and raise my head to watch. Dogfights. Open-air theatre. What's this? The three veer off. Are the German fighters wimping out? The Rotenhunde triumph. They come down low, machine guns rattle, and the wounded cry out. This drama is repeated a dozen times this morning. It isn't surprising that a few of the desperate guys who have lost all their nerve take up their weapons and shoot at the cowards in the retreating Messerschmitts. The artillery fire dies down a little around noon, though the Reds continue to fire aimlessly at our position. A delivery of food makes its way toward us. The second one didn't make it. Direct hit. The guy paints a colourful picture of blood, pea soup and brain. Enjoy your meal. Just take the food with you, comrade. My appetite has disappeared. What assholes these guys are. They still exist. They come and make our lives on the front miserable with their bloodthirsty stories. We are busy enough with our own stories up here. We have left plenty of blood yesterday and today, and do not care what is happening in the rear at the moment. The terrible artillery fire starts up again in the afternoon, and then the most horrible thing happens. There is a sulfurous flame, a deafening explosion, and the beams of our cover are torn to bits. The force of the air presses us against the trench walls. Clumps of dirt cover us. I am still half numb when I push through the shredded beams and climb out. Only then can I see the full picture. The neighbouring bunker, approximately three metres from us, has taken a direct hit. I see a large crater which extends all the way up to our dugout. Stinky yellow smoke boils over the area. God damn it, are they all dead? Most importantly, is he dead? Our dear lieutenant. Half mad, I leap into the crater. Pieces of uniform and limbs are sticking out of the dirt. I start digging hurriedly in the dirt, using my bare hands. I grab a hold of Hubner's head, which has been severed from the rest of his body. Finally, I find our little one buried up to his neck. In a mad rush, Rufer jumps into the hole. Within seconds we are able to free him from underneath the mass of earth. If only he would stop his terrible screaming, our dear little lieutenant. We have never heard him shout so loud before. He only has a few minutes left to live. His lower body and legs are crushed to a pulp. While we try to lift him out of the hole, a shell slams into the ground right next to us in a loud roar. A shower of shards rains down over us. Rufa collapses and the lieutenant's body slides on top of me. He is no longer screaming. A fist-sized piece of shrapnel has smashed into his face. Even in death he has protected me, his best comrade with his own body. Everything inside of me is numb. A film covers my eyes. I do not care any more. Even if they demolish the rest of our small group, at least it will be over. Peace, eternal peace. The memories of these hours of horror will no longer torture me. Orders to retreat come in the evening. 
The division will retreat to the Vetter line in the night and regroup in defensive formation. One order, one cold sentence, which hits us like the strike of a whip. Soldiers on the front understand what it means to take back a piece of land that has been soaked with the blood of comrades. This was hard-earned, metre by metre, under enormous casualties. Under the cover of night, my group, I have five men left in my group, feels their way back through the crater field. This is how it must have appeared at Verdun in 1918. The Reds continue their wild firing into our position. However, we are able to reach the cobblestone road by midnight. Nobody is talking, nobody is smoking. As per division orders, smoking is prohibited when aircraft are present. Talking. Everyone has enough to do with his own thoughts and with carrying his equipment. We finally reach Pochtovacha. This place was also badly hit. Some in the group are wounded. I was just about to lie down in a hole to sleep when a comrade approached me. You are ordered to go to the commandant. Two other group leaders are also there. The old guy salutes us and asks us, Who will volunteer to return to the front to take our dear Lieutenant Libertran his cross? I step forward. The other two leave. I almost think they were running. The commandant takes me aside and tells me something that I have already known for a long time. Teremki is probably no man's land, if not already in Russian hands. I decline to take anyone with me on this death ride. After the cross is finished, I place it over my shoulder, insert a pistol under my belt, a hand grenade in the shaft of my boots, and off I go. I take the shortest distance directly across the minefield. Damn it, the most direct path is right at the barn on the field. I don't need to mention that the other soldiers thought they were dealing with a maniac and that the men in the observation posts thought I was crazy. And yet, my mind has become sharper over the past few days. My intuition tells me that the Russians have not yet grasped our latest directional manoeuvre. They are still laying their fire stubbornly onto our positions that have long since been abandoned. This time there is no fire curtain between the village and me. Rather, I should say, the pile of dirt where houses once stood. Everything is going well. The closer I get to the village, the weaker the enemy fire, which eventually completely dies out. There is no one around as far as I can see. The silence is eating at my nerves. Is the Russian infantry going to begin its advance? Damn it. For the first time I am really afraid, really scared. The last thing that I need is for Hans to push a wild boar into his pants. No, I am not going to do that. With my hands trembling, I push the cross into the ground. I then pay him my respects, my one and only comrade, our lieutenant, at his final place of rest, and then start to cry like a child. What would you say to me now, my little lieutenant? Sobbing is for women. Pull your shit together, Hannes. These past few minutes of reflection have really refreshed me. No, little one, you will not see me act like a weeping boy. I am sorry. It has been a bit too much over these past few days. I then start to head back. Unbelievable to Remke without artillery fire. I didn't think it was possible. It is getting light out. I still have approximately two kilometres to cover. Who knows if the Russians saw me, or it was just out of coincidence. But all at once, five or six shells land near me. I throw myself into the dirt and clutch the ground. To the left and right, in front and behind me, trees stand burning from the impact. The howling and crashing in the air is like yesterday, though yesterday I was not alone. Small brisang shells buzz closer. These damn things approach without much warning. They're right here, ratch bum. They explode, causing shallow craters in the ground. They explode and release thousands of shards that slice anything close by. And then there is a terrible hit. When I try to get up again, I notice that I cannot. My right leg isn't responding. Scheisse, there is a large hole in my pants and blood is running out of it. My hands are also bloody. There is a strange pulling in my face and blood has just started dripping from it. Those must only be scratches, but my leg, damn leg. Man, you cannot lie here and fall victim to those red bastards. There must be a way. And there is. I get a move on under tremendous pain. Who's there at the barn, or where the barn used to be? It is my dear Sepp, and thankfully his sidecar motorcycle. This is when I black out. When I start to wake up, he has only one word for me. Rindvish. This makes me really happy. 
I know that he said it to conceal his emotions. What a loyal soul. He places me into the sidecar and races back. He finally stops at Pechtawaja. In between the cursing and laughter, he tells me that our troop has taken leave to rest for a few days to the rear of Wasilkal. He has suggested that as a result, I will be able to recover while being with the troops. What a fool, as if we even needed to talk about that. He then digs out his last bottle of vodka from down in his sidecar. It's a real small party this morning. As an extra bonus, we get to enjoy witnessing the downing of 24 aircraft by our invincible Messerschmitts. Sorry that we shot at you yesterday. Oh well, after that my Sep calls me an ox, and I know that we have become inseparable comrades. I am indescribably happy. For a few hours I am able to forget the fear and distress of the past few days. We have arrived in Barakhti and are joyfully greeted by our comrades. The commander shook my hand in silence, looking deeply into my eyes for a long time. The fact that he did not say anything was the best expression of gratitude for me. Afterward, I am bandaged up, which unfortunately cannot be performed without pain. And then the moment which I have been dreading all day arrives. The field doctor has ordered my transfer to the military hospital. One of the guys winks at me and says, Man, be happy, you get a taste of home. I punch him in the face. The commander sees it and approaches to ask what is going on. I ask for permission to stay with my comrades. He turns briefly to speak with the doctor and then says, I am unable to deny your request. You will remain here. How wonderful this day is. My stretcher stands in the shade of fruit trees in a meadow covered with flowers. The bees are buzzing and butterflies are playing their games. I am so happy and thankful that I am able to stay with my comrades. Only the hum and thundering from the front, and the pain that has now fully kicked in, reminds me of these past days. My group has dramatically shrunk in size. We will need each and every one of them for the next campaign. We cannot count on replacements. Was it not my duty to stay with my guys under such circumstances? I think the commander understood this. I am doing well except for the constant pain. The weather is awesome, and then there are these beautiful letters from my dear Roselle, this brave soldier's wife. The commander looks after me like a father. He gives me eggs, fresh butter, cream and honey. I have been using this time mostly for sleeping, which helps me forget, and we have so much to forget. Red fighter planes paid us a visit tonight and threw down a dozen or so bombs. This doesn't upset me as much after what I have lived through during these past days. One can hear the thunder emerging from the front as clearly as it was yesterday. Apparently the Russians have managed to establish a strong bridgehead on the DNEPR river. The front is very thin there, perhaps our break is over. That would be harsh and mean my transfer to the field hospital. A civilian has informed us that a group of eight Bolsheviks dressed as German soldiers went into the village to ask for German reinforcement troops in Barakhti. Because of this, the strength of the night watch has been doubled. One cannot be too careful behind the front. The entire division has gone out to battle. The brave regiments march past us on the street. You brave, remarkable lads, where are all the comrades that went shoulder to shoulder with you to the front when you were on the street the last time? One of the men approaches me on my stretcher to shake my hand. Why not? We have both bled in the drumfire of Kiev. Exhausted, he sits down next to me, drinks from my bottle, eats my ration, and has ten drawers from my last cigarette. He then told me something about the final hours before they were withdrawn from the front. Before we retreated, we laid minefields. The Russians somehow found out, at which point they collected the sick and disabled from the mental homes. The infantry then herded them over the minefields in front of them. It was an extraordinary picture, naked as they were when taken from their beds. They ran in lines toward our positions. Hundreds were torn apart by the mines. Only these losers could think of something so evil. And these guys are our opponent. The numbers of dead slowly make their way to us. The 530th Infantry Regiment was almost completely annihilated and will be filled in with the remainder of the 528th and 529th Infantry Regiments. The pain is starting to vanish. Thank goodness things are going better. Three PK units move out in the morning to secure the village. We receive news that a bunch of troops and partisan fighters were found outside of Kiev. 
They must have been planning to go through the thin front line to attack our troops from the rear. Other special forces, paratroopers, have landed far to the rear. The village is now encircled in a defensive ring. I am without pain for the first time and leave my stretcher for a first attempt at walking. I witness the interrogation of partisans in the meadow. A reconnaissance unit arrested a group whom they are now questioning. There are three young girls ranging in age from 18 to 20 and one boy around 17. They say they were labourers at a textile factory who were let go due to the lack of work. Their passports are too new and the amount of money they are carrying is too great for labourers. They cave in after two hours of interrogation and confess to being partisans. Their mission is from the infamous Major Friedman. They have the following orders. Join a second group of partisans near Wasilkow during the night of August 19th. The second group will bring highly sensitive explosives. The girls will find out the location of HQ here in Barakti and in Wasilkow, which are supposed to be blown up on August 20th. Wow, we are all really surprised. We were going to be attacked. We also learn something about the organisation of their group. They work in mixed groups of boys and girls, mostly students, no larger than five per group. Their tasks include the destruction of fuel and ammunition depots, bridges and roads. They also lay out aerial signals. They kill men stationed at outposts and motorcycle messengers. To ensure success, they have a well-established and expansive communication network. When the German troops moved in, competent red soldiers, mostly commissars, stayed behind disguised as everyday farmers in order to coordinate the work of partisan units. They are now working hand in hand with these terror groups. The mess that has been created behind the front will give us headaches for a long time to come. The translator finally asks the girls how they became partisans. What I heard deeply moved me. The murderer Friedman summoned them one day and gave them a choice to either go with these orders across German lines or witness their parents and siblings lined up along a wall and shot. Also, if they do not return, their relatives will be killed. Nevertheless, the commander decides that the four must be executed immediately. I can see how difficult it is for him to give this order, but this is how it has to be. The four are led away. Three young and fresh girls will die for these bloodthirsty hyenas in Kiev. A group of soldiers with rifles lines up, the girls are blindfolded. This is nothing for us old guys who are used to fighting with the devil and death. But these are three girls of great beauty for whom we feel compassion. Regardless, they are ordered to shoot iron bullets into these young bodies. I cannot witness this. I retreat to the most remote corner. Finally, after what seems like an eternity, I hear the rifle salvo. The war against civilians is not for us, Frontschweiner, frontline pigs. Everybody is very quiet for the rest of the afternoon. Russian bombers are attacking. We have dead and wounded. A group of partisans are arrested and shot after a short interrogation. I am doing much better. My wounds have healed almost completely. It's about time, because there are rumours about our next mission. Orders have arrived. We advance into position tonight. What am I saying, we? I have been ordered to stay behind. Does he have to give me orders? After a short back and forth, the commander, understanding the frontline soldier, agrees to let me move forward with my guys. Doctor, this boy is dying of boredom here. He belongs with his men on the front. What a joy. Why shouldn't this be possible? The positions on the front are now fortified. The mobile attack came to a halt weeks ago. We made the rotation to the front without any enemy fire worth mentioning. The trenches are awesome. A system of trenches and saps has been built. The line of fire is perfect. Our position holds the bridge and village of Pochtawaja. The Reds will get their heads bloodied if they tried to break through here. The rest of the day is used to deepen the trenches and repair the barbed wire blockades. After nightfall, small troops lay out minefields. Shells are only finding their way to us sporadically. For the most part, they fall short of the target and explode in the Weta marshes. After prepping us with heavy artillery fire during the early morning hours, the Russians attempt to storm our position. Wave after wave approaches and breaks down under our fire. Man, oh man, it's like target practice. It is incredible what reserves these guys possess. It is sheer insanity to attack our fortified position. Regardless, 
new masses of soldiers are still coming forward. At present, they are huddled down in the depressions in the same line formations as they started. Our shells tear them apart and our machine guns mow them down. And then I see something that as a soldier moves me deeply. For hours now, enemy soldiers have been trying to approach the bridge with great bravery. The Russians installed heavy machine guns in the houses just a few hundred metres to the rear in order to give them fire protection. Again, 18 to 20 men jump up and run toward the bridge just to be shot to bits and pieces. Two Peques and half a dozen of our machine guns spread fire across the opposing riverbank. It is crazy to try and break through here. Heaps of fallen soldiers are piling up in front of the bridge. Two Russian soldiers, the remainder of the last wave, run back to the houses crazed with horror. Ten metres to the houses, their own machine guns rattle and hack them into mounds of flesh. This drama is repeated several times before the Russians are able to pull back the entire line. Can anyone understand these people? Can anyone understand that they are so much under the control of their commissars that they will not quarter these bloodthirsty hyenas? A bullet would be too precious for them. Is there anyone who understands this? The heat is brutal and beats down on our heads. Now we get the chance to experience the other side of the coin for yesterday's target practice. Several hundred are lying dead down there in the depression and are putting out such a stench that many of us start to puke like butcher's dogs. Keeping a wet handkerchief over my face brings only little relief. I have a raging headache. I'm not at all up to par. I remember little of the past few days. A fierce fever has gotten a hold of me. I am back in Barakti. Today is the first day that I don't have a temperature. It went away as fast as it had started. The only thing remaining is the miserable weakness and my rubber knees. Yet it's not so bad. They have butter, eggs and milk here. Everything will be karasho, good in Russian, within 24 hours. After quite some time, I received mail from Roselle and my mother today. All will be better soon, and with so much joy. It must be. Everyone is urgently needed. There are fierce battles, and I need to be with my men. The Moscow radio station has its German hour tonight. We, 299th Infantry Regiment, are once again their topic. It's amazing how the guy can rant. 299th Division is a division of murderers. Orders have been issued to no longer take prisoners. What an honour for our division to be addressed by name from the gentlemen in Moscow. Their anger is a measure of our success. Otherwise, they would not be so angered. According to broadcasts from the very same station, we had been annihilated near Zwierhel. Yet somehow we are now causing them huge losses. Whatever, we know what to expect. It is my birthday. When will I be able to celebrate it in the circle of my dear folk once again? The sky shows its sunny face again after yesterday's rain. I feel a boundless yearning for Roselle and Erica and the peacefulness of my little apartment. When will I be able to sleep in a real bed again, not in a wet hole in the ground? When will I be able to cross the street again without listening for gunshots, approaching shells or aircraft? Dreams, dreams, when will they become reality? As a special surprise, the long arm of the Russian railroad cannon reaches Barakti for the first time. Huge projectiles slam roaring into the ground. What a birthday salute. A third of the village lies in ruins after two hours of fire. I hear the messages on the radio tonight. The speaker was just beginning to announce the first message when someone yelled out anti-fascist slurs. The German speaker's words are rebutted and denied. According to the loud yelling, the Russian station must be close by, in Kiev. What crazy ideas these guys have. I am going back to the front tonight. I do not care what the doctor has to say. I am back with my men. A few things have changed here. The barbed wire barriers were doubled in depth after the Russians managed to make it to the first trench and wreak havoc with their hand grenades. There are many craters between the trenches. There are four crosses made out of birch with helmets placed on top. One of the helmets has a large hole in it. Schumacher also fell. Our position is no longer being hit with stray fire. Walls of well-positioned fire rolls over the position day after day. Heavy nightly attacks from the Russians. They use those damn rifle grenades for the first time. No longer are they causing just small injuries. The first firewall tosses shrapnel around our heads early in the morning. 
Two dead, six wounded. Our morale has reached a low point. Someone has brought news from the rear that there is a 1,000-man replacement column marching toward us. We do not like that at all. We had hoped that after the fall of Kiev, we would be sent back to Germany to regroup. According to rumours, that has been the common practice in the past. Scheisse! The milkbeards are coming. Even I believed the rumours. I could slap myself for this. Any hopes of getting out of this witch's cauldron are put to rest. It is becoming increasingly difficult for me to sound optimistic and positive in my letters to Roselle. But it has to be this way. I know how important my letters are to keep her dear soul in balance. She will be happy and joyful, and will not know about our dejected spirits. Obstfelder received the Knight's Cross. Extensive manuevers apparently are closing in toward Kiev, similar to those at Sedan in the west. Once again we serve as the pincer of the encircling arms. We are called out to shed some blood during the week-long trench battles. Always waiting, waiting. We are not allowed to attack, but have to hold the line against increasing pressure from the Russians. The Red Artillery has been hammering our positions with calibers of all sizes for hours now. I hope we make it. Pressed flat on the floors of our holes, we await attack orders, or the end to all this suffering. A nice direct hit. Scheisse, it's all Scheisse. Today is again a big day for the Soviet Air Force, which comes somewhat as a change. Budeni's swallows arrive in flocks from Kiev. Out of politeness, they initially hand us their business cards in the form of thousands of pamphlets. Eventually, dozens of large, long tin drums drop from the sky. My first thought is, firebombs. But since they released their bombs right over our heads, there is no immediate threat for us. We look curiously above the hedges and down into the valley, where these damned things crash down. Strange, there are no detonations. The tin drums just burst open. Hundreds of small bearings fly through the air. They are shimmering like tin cans. About ten minutes later, the valley is in flames. Small yellowish-violet flames are everywhere. An observer from B position comes to us shortly after. His group witnessed the whole spectacle in close proximity. The six to eight-metre-long cylinders were filled with small cans. After the cylinders exploded, the cans inside swelled about and burst open. Flames were everywhere a few minutes later. Phosphorus bombs, another evil trick. Despite this, we should be thankful to the Red Devils. They have transformed the valley and its heaps of dead bodies into a crematorium. No stench of decay will turn our stomachs upside down tomorrow. What would have happened if Budeni's swallows had aimed better? Ribs castle style, well smoked as someone has remarked. Changing guard at B position at three o'clock hours. Six men move into the lonely position. It is quiet despite our expectations. Well, at least what we call quiet. Sporadic shell fire and the rattling of a single machine gun. Wet fog hangs over our positions. It is abysmally cold. At least it provides good cover. The enemy is unable to see us walking through the barbed wire barriers as we carefully and slowly crawl through the minefield. Thirty minutes later we reach the forward trenches of B position. The fog lies in thick banks in the valley. The enemy might attempt to breach our position's front line under the cover of this fog. We are the eyes of our division, and as such, we see the first waves of enemy fighters approach within half an hour. Our protective artillery fire lands well and eliminates the first two waves, but more masses are clashing against our section of the front. If it continues like this, we may have to retreat to the primary position. No one says this aloud, however. German soldiers do not retreat that quickly. Our observation post is quickly altered into a defensive position. The camouflage tarp is removed and a step is dug into the wall in order to bring the machine gun into place. Hand grenades are lined up, ready to be used. The bayonet is attached to the rifle to prepare for one-on-one -on -one battle. The Reds have managed to break through to the right of our position. Quite a few are torn apart by the mines, but the Red Devils don't mind a few hundred casualties. The Bolsheviks have understood the importance of our defensive position and bring more and more reinforcement troops. Their masses attack non-stop. Their artillery fires without a break and from a great distance directly into our trenches. The fog is long gone. The sun is beating down on us and driving us crazy. Terrible one-on-one -on -one fights have erupted in several sections around us. 
It means nothing to ask for heroic individual actions. Everyone is a hero here. Everyone simply fulfills his duty to the best of his ability. The Bolsheviks are finally pushed back and retreat around noon. The Russian artillery takes its angry revenge. One fire attack after another rains down on us. The wall of enemy shellfire lies approximately 100 meters to our rear, by about 17 o'clock hours, and moves slowly toward us. Explosions are coming closer and closer to us. Just now it almost got us. Loud sounds similar to an organ approach above our heads, three times, four times. At once we throw ourselves onto the floor of the trench. Again there is a crashing as if the world itself were exploding. Dirt is flying around our ears and rains down on our helmets. A fist-sized chunk of shell slams into the ground no further than a metre from me. What good luck. Luck is what one needs in a war. Casualties appear small when measured against the successes. Piles of dead Russian soldiers are lying in front of our section and in the most forward trenches. The worst thing is that we will be sick to our stomachs tomorrow from the stench of the decaying bodies. Once again, we will be running around like nurses with our handkerchiefs over our faces. But there is an unexpected change of events. We receive orders to be replaced in the evening. No one can understand what this message does to the emotions of a soldier on the front. There were probably some guys who even cried. It's an issue of nerves. The messenger, the bearer of good news, is celebrated like a demigod. He receives our last cigarettes and alcohol. The exchange is done at midnight, without any major incident. We reach the supply troops in Barakti in the early hours of the morning. Now it is about sleeping, sleeping and more sleeping. The heat is unbearable. The moist, hot air makes every move torturous. Flies, thousands of fat flies, make our lives a living hell. Day and night they are everywhere. In thick masses they land on anything edible. I lose my appetite every time I think about where these flies started, on the piles of dead flesh and in the latrines. A part of the occasionally severe consequences of this situation are the gastrointestinal and stomach illnesses. There can be no talk of rest or sleep. Since partisan movement has increased behind the front, thus making the area unsafe, the dreaded watch patrols are implemented, which are meant to bring back partisans and defectors captured near the front. This time they are not young and fresh girls, but fanatical Bolsheviks. They look at us with their empty faces and smile. A body search discovers many interesting things. Russian maps, thousands of rubles, and brand new passports. Since we are already tense and irritable from the brutal heat, their stupid smiles push us over the edge. The interrogations are appropriately stormy and effective. One of the partisans has a pistol aimed at his head and just says with a smile, Karasho! After this, they leave him to the translator who beats him black and blue. The boy is now moaning on the ground and confesses everything. He lists the orders and the people who gave them. We learn from this that one can threaten a Russian with taking his life, put a rope around his neck and he will simply smile in your face. However, if you beat them up, you will be able to see the fear in their eyes and they will confess whatever you want to know. It started to rain lightly during the night and is now raining cats and dogs. The ground turns into black mud within hours. What were once roads and streets yesterday have turned into creeks of mud today. Muddy water shoots through the gulches into the valley. Within hours, the bottom of the valley has been transformed into a lake. You can't get anywhere by vehicle, not even a kilometer. Our boots act like filters, though unfortunately in the opposite direction. Mud goes in, water goes out, and the dirt stays inside. I think of the brave comrades in their trenches and holes on the front. These poor Schweiner. They will not have a single dry thread on their bodies in this weather. Their holes will be half filled with dirty water. Nevertheless, the artillery is barking today. Damn, when will this terrible trench war be over? Rain and still more rain. I hope it won't continue like this for the next 14 days. Otherwise, the attack on Kiev is down the drain. The same grey soup. We will be going to the front again tomorrow. Everything is even grey and dull inside of me. The past few days have not brought us the rest that we so well deserve. We are even more tired and jaded than before, and we are ordered back to the front, into the dreadful muddy holes and in all this miserable weather. 
We receive final orders at noon. We have a difficult task ahead of us. Infantry support in the Saporosia. Of all sectors, we are ordered to this terrible one. This part of the front has tasted even more blood than the Pochtawaja sector. It is one of the most complex sectors of the entire Western Kiev front. The area is covered in thick woods, expansive swamps, and is very difficult to oversee, which allows the Russians to pull all kinds of dirty tricks. Well, we'll see. I'm not at all happy about this entire situation. At least we have one joy today. The rain has stopped. Thank God. The sun hangs hot and bright in the sky. One is surprised by how fast the roads and paths dry out. Where does all this mud soup come from? Nevertheless, the heavy vehicles get stuck more than once or twice. They are stuck in the mud up to their frames. Hooray! With much effort and sweat, they have been pulled out. The way to Saporosha indicates to us how important the tasks are at the edge of the front. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, for approximately 20 kilometres to the rear of the units fighting on the front. It is unbelievable that this thick line extends for some thousand kilometres, withstands the pressure and eats its way east. This is different than France. There, the military units were organised five kilometres deep. First, there were the combat units, next the regiments for rotation and replacement, then the reserves, the marching battalions, and finally a division for emergencies. Yes, dear gentlemen at home, every little shooter-ass here is a hero. Everyone, even the weakest guy, needs to be a real man on the Eastern Front, otherwise he will encounter misfortune. Then the Russians will break through and there will be nobody behind us to stop them. It is nice to hear the special announcements. Father Kraus smiles silently. Dear Father Kraus, let it be told, we have already gone through a dozen or more Cheman de Dames, and who knows how many Dumamonts are still in front of us. Father Kraus, it has always been the same guys who have been giving their blood on the front line since the 22nd of June. And Mother Kraus is also happy, but in a different way. Where is my boy? Is he still alive? Is he healthy or... Even if he gave his life for the victory, the mourning mother's heart would still feel joy for the victory and glory of the German flag. She would be proud of her boy who is lying somewhere in the vast lands of Russia, with his eyes wide open. O oh, you wives and mothers back in the homeland, we are aware of your bravery. We are no longer your sons and husbands, but your comrade fighters. In our own way, every one of us gives his or her all. We reach Saporosia in the afternoon and prepare for the replacements at night. We are replacing a group from Knight's Cross recipient Major, Albrecht Lanz's 396th Infantry Regiment. They fought bravely. I envy the men under this wonderful leader and person. He's a man who has intelligence written all over his tanned face, which is full of humour. He has a kind word or a joke for everyone. Here is the task our infantry has received. Form reconnaissance troops and complete an aggressive investigation of the area up to Kiev. It is typical for this campaign that soldiers from all branches take on infantry duties as needed. There are no designated headquarters anymore. The higher ranks are no longer giving orders from secure locations. Now everyone, officer or secretary, carries a weapon at all times and uses it at least a dozen times a day. The Russians must have noticed something. The replacement turns out to be an evil undertaking with many casualties. They hammer us with spiral mines, insidious hand grenades, and artillery shells of considerable calibre. It quiets down around noon. The Russians did not use their opportunity for an attack. It would have created chaos and cost many casualties. A scout troop with two prisoners returns in the morning. An especially tough and fanatic enemy lies on the opposite side, hand-picked members of the Bolshevik party, like a red SS. There is heavy shell fire all day. If the Russians only knew how small their opponent's unit actually was. Yes, if. It is good that they often do not have an overall understanding of the situation. We are beating them at their own game. We build bogus positions with large oven pipes pointed skyward and work on the fortifications all day. Russian scouts are patrolling the front line. Breitung and Little Horung are taken by surprise and mutilated by hand grenades and bayonets. I move forward with a few men to free them from their miserable situation. The Russians are throwing egg grenades at our feet on our way back. 
It is a shitty situation if you are transporting seriously wounded men. We take cover in a bomb crater as a 200 kilo shell approaches with a roar and slams right in between us. I think every single hair on my body stood straight up at that moment. The glowing hot projectile is sticking out of the mud no more than a metre from me. A dud. This is a rare occasion for the otherwise good Russian ammunition. I don't need to mention that we had never before left a cover faster than that before. Boy, oh boy, if that grenade had actually worked, a tin would have sufficed for an official funeral of our ten-man group. We are leaving our trenches for a very risky reconnaissance task in the evening. According to intelligence, the Russians placed a high-voltage barbed wire barrier into operation yesterday. Our assignment is to discover its path and locate the power station. This time, however, we are unable to fulfil our task, because the Russians commence a heavy surprise attack. It all goes so fast that we do not have time to retreat behind our lines. We are in a terrible situation. We lie in the deep ditch of a small creek no more than 80 metres in front of the enemy lines. We see the Bolsheviks storming left and right, sometimes so close we could touch them. We hear the commissars giving their orders. We are lucky that it is a dark night. We would meet our end if they were to detect us. German and Russian tracers are crisscrossing over our ditch. Minutes weigh like years. The Russians flood back after about an hour. We immediately offer flank protection. Our machine gun rattles until the barrel overheats. And then our comrades arrive and everything is good again. A terrible crashing raises us from our uneasy sleep. The Bolsheviks are placing heavy artillery on our sector. Except for the combat positions, everyone takes cover in the bunker, because shells exploding in the trees is not to everyone's liking. I am on guard in the most forward trench near the woods. There are explosions, one after another, in the swampy meadows. A majestic beech tree stands approximately 100 metres from me. The other guys have named it the Blood Beach. This is the only dry spot and is surrounded by swamps. The red dogs continuously attempt to break through this location. The tree will be blown up tomorrow, for it is assumed that it is used by Russian artillery as a marker on the landscape. What a pity for such a beautifully grown tree. It is crazy. One is lying here under fire and observes a tree, the sunlight, and anything that plays in the light. Man, Hannes, doesn't this make you long for your beloved forest in the Taunus? German mountain range, and beautiful Sunday walks with Roselle? Instead, you should be thinking about the shells that are slamming into the ground in front of you. A few large calibers start to arrive at this moment. It is ridiculous to use such large calibers that are shot from a long distance on a position like this. Damn it! What is that? Where is our beech tree? A cloud of menacing black smoke has engulfed it. As the smoke rises, the tree starts to tilt, at first slowly, then faster and faster until it slams to the ground. The first thing I hear is the thunder of the impact and then the crashing of the tree branches hitting the ground. Now you see, Hannes, your dreams about your Taunus forest are really not well suited here. Lunch does not taste too good today because we are too nervous. An ass approaches us with news, which is now being hotly discussed in the trenches. First, there is the replacement order. We will get out of here today. But when it rains, it pours. We are going back to our old positions in Pochtawajaweta. This is the horrible sector where we lost our best. Second, the general attack on Kiev will start in two days. Finally, finally, one could shed tears of joy. This terrible trench war will be over. It is unbelievable. I finally get to know why we had to be engaged in this nasty trench war for weeks. Colonel General Heinz Guderian from the north and Kleist from the south have encircled a large area. An enormous encirclement has been achieved which is unprecedented in the history of war. There will be a battle of encirclement and annihilation that people will probably still be talking about in a hundred years. Man, imagine that, when in a couple of years you're helping your kids with their history homework and the topic for the next lesson will be the annihilating battle of Kiev. You can then tell your kids all the things that are not mentioned in the history books, your experiences. Man, Paul, you, myself and the rest of us, we're all part of this. No matter what has happened so far, is it not amazing that we are allowed to participate in this? Who's thinking about the fact we have not yet ended it and that the next few hours could bring death to any one of us? 
But today, today, tomorrow we are going to roll, and who knows, the day after tomorrow we might attack. Which one of us, Frunchwein, frontline pigs, is thinking about death? We wouldn't be able to fight with all of this thinking going on. This time the replacement was without hassle, and the weather is great. Everybody is in an excellent mood. There are no grumpy faces anywhere. The news has trickled through. The attack will start tomorrow. We now hate the city that has been lying before us for weeks without permission to enter. But just wait, Kiev. Proud city full of weapons. Things are going to change soon. Our mouths hang open in amazement during our march. A lot of work has been done during these past three days. Heavy mortars and long barrel cannons have been put into position and covered with camouflage netting. And there are shells, lots of shells. We have never seen that many in such a large pile. We reach Wasilkow in the afternoon. There, the first thing we do is have a feast and drink some alcohol. After that, there is some thorough grooming. Only when you are clean-shaven and washed do you qualify for one of these precious corner lots in the mass grave. Meanwhile, we desperately wait for our attack orders. The attack has been rolling since five o'clock hours. The main goal is to establish a good attack position for the general attack. A raiding patrol to Gatnoya, which had already incurred bloody casualties six weeks ago, delivers important intelligence. It appears that the Russians almost abandoned their most forward line. Did they retreat to a better fortified line? Gatnoje is taken by storm. During the course of the afternoon, Pochtawaja is run over, and we are back to our previous front line. With this we accomplish the requirements necessary for the general attack. We dig in, which turns out to be a good idea, for the Russian fire curtain begins soon after we are finished. Our own ordnance returns the fire. Some hundred cannons fire in order to make use of the remaining daylight to zoom in on the targets. Only a few large calibers arrive from positions far behind our lines. However, wherever these stinking sweaty Schweiner are, there is death. We are still in our initial position for the general attack. The neighbouring division is only making slow progress. Despite heavy Russian artillery fire, we experienced frontline soldiers are able to get some rest. Our well-honed instincts tell us that the Russians are preparing for a defensive posture and will not attack. Budeni's swallows appear by surprise around noon. However, the situation is different than the last time in Teremki. Flax, calibers of 8.8 .8 and 2 cm, have been arranged in masses to maintain the attack. The scenes that follow are awesome. The Bolsheviks perform two laps of honour. Our flax don't fire a single shot. Great. The Russians, who were unable to see our camouflaged anti-aircraft cannons, feel like they own the sky. They return with just as much force as they did during the initial days of August. And then it starts, the tack-tack-tack of the two centimetres flax and the tinny sounds of the 8.8 .8 centimetres. Eighteen Martin bombers crash to the ground in flames within the next twenty minutes. Well, now it's really serious, Father Budeni. Our 21 and 30.5 centimetres cannons have been firing onto the Russian defence lines around the outskirts of the city for the last 24 hours. There are rolling attacks from our Stukas. A dark black cloud hangs over the city after a few hours. These guys deliver precision work. According to orders, the residential neighbourhoods of the city are not to be attacked. They are to attack the fortress, the train stations, ammunition depots and the Dnieper bridges. Orders for the general attack arrive in the afternoon. Tomorrow is the day. Guys, prepare for the mass grave. You can live out your hatred against this city that has been right in front of your faces for weeks, though as of yet unattainable. Tomorrow, finally, finally.